And as you can see here, the Earth is the third dimension. Okay, so I have a number of, um, what is it called, cryptozoology. This is where we have uh, an artist's renderings of some of the uh, characters that we have heard from in the past. And uh, whether it's Bigfoot down to uh, Nessie or Thunderbird or the Kraken, you've heard a lot of those. If you're from Texas, you've heard of the Jackalope. And it's, a, it's just an idea that these were some of the creatures that when we had the ability to create anything we wanted, these were the kinds of creatures that we brought about in the beginning before the human body was around. So the text says, the earth was an expression of divine mind with its own laws, its own plan, its own evolution. Souls longing to feel the beauty of the seas, the winds, the forests, the flowers, mixed with them and expressed themselves through them. They also mingled with the animals and made an imitation of them. Thought forms, they played at creating, they imitated God. So we were able to insert our consciousness into anything. It could have even been trees, it could have been an ocean of water, it could be a river or the winds even, because we were just taking on a consciousness of what it was like to be in that form. That's not to say that all of those things have souls. Those are what I would call elementals or what Casey called elementals. Uh, that would be things that were more programmed to fulfill a uh, part of God's divine plan rather than having a free will soul be a part of that. So what we were doing was actually not what God had planned for us in the first place. But in playing, in imitating, that interfered with what had already been set in motion, and thus the stream of mind carrying out the plan for Earth gradually drew souls into its current. They had to go along with it in the bodies they had themselves created. And if you remember back to an earlier slide where I was showing all of the people that were doing the white water rafting, and they were all gathered together in the rubber raft going, shooting the rapid, so to speak. And uh, what uh, Tom Chagru is indicating here is that uh, as we kept staying with the earth and we became addicted into being in three dimensions and the limitations of it, we, uh, we got drawn into the current, which means that we were really forgetting who we are and what we were originally created to be, God's companions and co-creators. So some more cartoon drawings of what's there. Uh, what I talked about in the previous ones, they were strange bodies, mixtures of animals, a patchwork of ideas about what it would be pleasant to enjoy in the flesh. Down through the ages, fables of centaurs, cyclops, etc., have persisted as a relic of this beginning of the soul's tendency of Earth. And so you can imagine that somebody says, I want to be able to run as fast as a horse and yet have more of a human uh, uh, interaction with the dexterity of the opposing thumbs and all of that. Or I want the great strength of a cyclops, even though you give up a lot of things that go along with that and the ability to swim and breathe underwater if you're a mermaid and so on. Sex already existed in the animal kingdom, but the souls and their thought forms were androgynous. So they had no gender one way or another. When we would come into the earth because we didn't need to come in through the birth canal, there was no reason for us to create genitalia of one of either male or female. So to experience sex, they created thought forms for companions, isolating the negative force in a separate structure and retaining the positive within themselves. This objectification is what man calls Lilith, the first woman. And I know it's a little hard to uh, pick out in the Bible because you hear references to Lilith. Let's see if I can describe this. We want to be able to experience sex. We need to have two different genders. And so we go ahead and say, let's go ahead and put the receptive force, the uh, uh, in what we talk about as being females, into uh, or create a thought form that we would call Lilith. That is not a soul at this point. We maintained our soul position and kind of said, let's go ahead and take the, uh, uh, the yin and the yang, and we'll keep the yin over on the male side and the yang on the female side. And that will give us the greatest fulfillment when we are trying to experience sex. And we're going to go on to figure out when we quit trying to divide ourselves into separate uh, sexual partners and when we started doing it as souls. And here we go. 
So this entanglement of souls in what man calls matter was a probability from the beginning. But God did not know when it would happen until the souls of their own choice had caused it to happen. Now, the graphic I have above is kind of like the pinball game in which, again, God knows everything that we can do, but doesn't know the order that we are going to take these things in. Just knows these are all the possibilities, which means that God has already created a way of escape for every one of the temptations that we have out there. Of the souls which God created, and he created all souls in the beginning, none has been made since. Only a comparative few have come into the experience of the solar system, though many have gone through or are going through a similar entanglement in other systems. So as uh, the Casey readings talk about, there is soul entrapment throughout the universe. As I had showed in previous slides, and I was showing a picture of the night sky with all the stars that are out there, if there are inhabitable planets, and I don't mean by Earth standards, but planets in which... Uh, people are, are souls are attracted to go ahead and insert their consciousness into whatever life can exist there they become entrapped in those places as well so the uh you know we we have a relatively few just a minute if we're talking about an infinite number we had just a minute just a pinprick of the souls that God created that are entrapped in the universe are here on earth. So there's a little tiny amount of us that are here on earth. And as I understand it, the earth is probably one of the better places in the uh, universe to be entrapped. It's kind of a nicer spot than what uh, some of them end up being. The graphic, if you've been looking at it, you can probably figure out it's showing the cycle of reincarnation in which the life ends for the old man on the left, goes through the death process, and then comes out as a newborn babe on the right and goes through the maturation cycle again. A way of escape for the souls which were entangled in matter was prepared. A form was chosen to be a vehicle for the soul on earth, and the way was made for souls to enter earth and experience it as a part of their cycle. Of the forms already existing on earth, one of the anthropoid apes most nearly approached the necessary pattern. So if you look at the, uh, at the graphic on the top, what the Casey readings were indicating, and Tom Chagru kind of con condensed it into one paragraph here, is we took a form as souls, we took a form that was already here, and it was an ape. We don't know which one, didn't make it clear. But you can see on the left side, we started out with more of an ape, and then it started to go through an evolution that was going to make it to the necessary pattern, which is the modern day or Adamic body man that you see all the way on the right. We get into more detail in the next slide. Souls descended on these ape hoverings uh, apes hovering above and about them rather than inhabiting them and influence them to move toward a different goal from the simple one they have been pursuing so if they just wanted to you know hang out in the uh, in the trees and the in the bush and all that uh, all of a sudden they started to set higher goals or higher priorities for them they came down out of the trees they built fires made tools lived in communities and began to communicate with each other Swiftly, even as man measures time, they lost their animal look, shed bodily hair, and took on refinements of manner and habit. So in the two graphics I have up above, you, I, I think the one on the left is the uh, famous scene toward the beginning of uh, 2001 Space Odyssey in which you have these apes that uh, are just learning how to be able to use all the capabilities that they have. Well, imagine that they have souls hovering about each one of them that's urging them intuitively to be able to start using tools and to work as, in communities and to uh, you know, start doing all the improvements that uh, has led us to where we are today. And then the next part, we didn't uh, quite shut all the bodily hair yet, but you see over there on the right from the Planet of the Apes that uh, I, I, Clearly, there's high-functioning beings, and at the point uh, on the right, you're able to see this is where the soul was actually inhabiting the body once we were able to gather in communities, use tools, build buildings, and so on. Uh, we didn't look like that, but it was the closest thing I could pull uh, from a graphics library to be able to show it to you. But notice that this says swiftly, even as man measures time. So in other words, this answers a great deal about the evolutionary pattern they're going 
uh, you know, especially a traditional Christian says, you know, if, if we really did descend from apes, where are all of the fossils that we have that are connecting all of the other species as they evolved over the years? Well, let's face it, if we were swiftly, even as we measure time, evolving from what you see on the left to the right and beyond, you wind up having very few fossils that are available for people to uh, discover when they start doing archaeological digs later on. So there's a little uh, uh, science or logic to what's uh, going on in that explanation. All this was done by the souls working through glands. Now, those are the seven chakras or spiritual centers of the body, also called the endocrine system. And you see the uh, representation of the order they come in in the body there. So working through the glands until the body of the ape was an objectification in the third dimension of the solar system of the soul that hovered above it. Then the soul descended into the body and earth had a new inhabitant, man humanity. Uh, obviously, this was written in 1942 when we didn't have politically correct wording, but I'm doing what I can with it. The uh, So you're seeing in the graphic there, as far as the kundalini path, that's what it's called when you have the spiritual energy that starts in the gonads and moves up on through the light and the adrenals, thyrus, thy, thymus, thyroid, pineal, and pituitary. So when you, uh, when you go through that process, that's what happens in meditation, as the energy is raised through those seven spiritual centers. And in so doing, it allows the soul to come into the body and manifest itself perfectly. And that's what Jesus showed us. We are not manifesting this the spiritual energy perfectly, and that's how come we wind up making poor choices and we make mistakes and we have violence and we have, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, crime and pedophiles and things like that. But once we get to the point where we're, we're perfectly manifesting the Christ consciousness within the body, those seven centers are how we're able to affect everything about the body to allow that to happen. He appeared as a consciousness within an animal, a consciousness which was felt on the earth in five different places at the same time as the five races. Uh, I'm showing you up on the map there when you see the different colors. You have the white one showing the uh, Caucasian, Asian, uh, black. Uh, we have uh, the red race, which was Atlantis. So it's not really in the in the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantis was up at that time. And then the Andes Mountains was where the Hispanic race came from. And it goes into a description of that as far as the white race appeared in the Caucasus, the Carpathians and Persia. The yellow race appeared in what is now the Gobi Desert. The black race appeared in the Sudan and the upper West African area. The red white race appeared in Atlantis and the brown race appeared in the Andes. So it's just showing you a, uh, a current map. I've got a, uh, another one coming up that's going to show uh, all of the continents as if they were above ground at the same time, even though they were not. And there it is. You're seeing, really, you're seeing what's added is Lemuria and Atlantis over there to the side. And then between them, you're seeing the continent of Mu. Uh, and so if you ever hear of Atlantis, you hear of Mu, you hear of Lemuria, then that's what it's uh, referring to as far as the basic location for it. Obviously, that's not not exact. As a matter of fact, uh, in the America, if you're looking at it on the uh, all the way to the right or all the way to the left, that was part of the ocean back at uh, the where the Mississippi Delta is. In fact, you'll see it soon enough. The Pacific coast of South America was then the western coast of Lemuria. The Atlantic seaboard of the United States comprised the lowlands of Atlantis. Persia and the Caucasus were rich lands, the Garden of Eden. The poles of the earth, as we know them today, were tropical and semi-tropical. The Nile emptied into the Atlantic Ocean. The Sahara was fertile and inhabited. The Mississippi Basin was part of the ocean. Okay, here we are on the East Coast, and this was the lowlands of the continent of Atlantis. That means all this was ocean over here. Uh, going from the Great Lakes in the Mississippi Basin was all part of the ocean as far as that goes. It's a, not a big deal as far as, you know, <laughs> trying to explain soul development, but it does answer a lot of questions and, uh, about continents that you've probably heard about for years and didn't even know what questions to ask. Uh, the quote on the top is uh, from me.
<laughs> I hadn't found it uh, worded this way anywhere else, but it really does to me uh, identifies the real difference between religions and the Casey readings. Most religions teach that if you follow their tenets, you will be allowed to leave the earth and go to heaven, as in it's someplace else. The truth is that the moment you truly realize that heaven is a state of mind, you are joyous wherever you choose to go in all of creation once you've achieved the Christ consciousness. So in other words, it isn't that we're trying to be good so that we can go someplace else, which is in heaven. We learn to manifest the Christ consciousness so beautifully within our lives that we are absolutely in heaven wherever we go. So the text says, the problem was to overcome the attractions of the earth to the extent that the soul would be as free in the body as out of it. Only when the body was no longer a hindrance, hindrance to the free expression of the soul would the cycle of earth be finished. Okay, so uh, probably the best thing, and I, I've alluded to it before, but when we have that funnel psychology in which we come into a finite point, and the point is like the physical body, and then we go into a subconscious or even superconscious part of the mind, we are, in, as Jesus did, come, supposed to be able to come into a physical body and have a perfect connection with the divine within at all times, not just when we meditate. And so that was the problem, is that the earth causes us to pay so much attention to our five senses that and our survival and that we need to eat and we need to breathe and we need to have sex and we need to have all these things. The attractions of earth to the extent that the soul would be as free in the body is out of it so that the body does not hinder us once the, uh, the soul were to inhabit it. That's the goal of what we're uh, here on earth to do. Now, what your, uh, I'll read the text first, and then I'll go ahead and play the, uh, the video. In a smaller field, this was the drama of free will and creation. In a still smaller field, each atom of the physical body, being a world in itself, is a drama of free will and creation. The soul puts life into each atom, and each atom is a reflection in flesh of the soul's pattern. Now, what you're getting ready to see here is a uh, clip from the very end of Men in Black. Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith getting into their black limo and driving off. And now you see Manhattan and now New York and now the Earth. And then you see the moon jet on by and then the other planets in our solar system. And then the next thing you know, we back out far enough until you wind up seeing the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy seems to be contained within that marble that's being picked up by what has to be an absolutely gigantic alien who's playing marbles with us and collecting them in the bag right there. The whole idea of this is to try to give an entirely different perspective of everything. If, um, if you went to Disneyland, I don't know, probably 30, 40 years ago, there was a, uh, where Star Tours is now, used to be a, a ride called Inner Space. It was uh, <clears throat> sponsored by Monsanto. And the whole idea of it was that we uh, get in these little cars and we are shrunk down and we continue to shrink so that we are put into, initially we see the snowflake as being gigantic. And then we actually get down and start seeing the molecules of the, of the snowflake. And then we see the atoms of the snowflake until we get into the nucleus of the atom. And it, there's this large room in which you're right next to the nucleus, this throbbing red sphere inside the middle of the atom. And you look up and it looks exactly like the night sky does. And you're in a very clear field. So in other words, if you get down to the quarks uh, size of an atom and you look out, it looks exactly like it does at our level when we look out into the galaxy and see all the stars out there. So there are an infinite number of manifestations, as you saw with the gigantic aliens that were playing marbles with our galaxy. Now, this is, uh, this is a helpful graphic to be able to explain a concept that I know a lot of people, when they start studying this, say, what in the world is, is going on here? Women are described as being the negative force, and men are described as the positive. Well, what you're seeing up here in the top graphic is a 9-volt battery, and you're seeing that the pattern of the motion of electrical current goes from the negative post 
to the positive post. So if you're thinking electricity, it makes a lot more sense than it does to, uh, to put our definitions of negative and positive in, uh, in, in the context of what Casey's indicating here. In other words, from the negative side, this is the giving side. This is uh, the more female energy in which is giving and the male is receiving in, uh, in that kind of a, a case. And it shows that if you were to break the connection with the little slide switch down there, you break the connection, the light goes away. So if we didn't constantly have energy passing back and forth between the positive, negative and positive poles, the light bulb, every time that uh, nice switch goes out, quits lighting up. So the entire universe is based around this exchange of energy and the flow goes in that direction. So here's the text. There were males and females in these new pure races and both had complete souls. Eve replaced Lilith. Remember Lilith was more of a thought form than an actual uh, being. Eve replaced Lilith and became a complement to Adam the ideal companion for the threefold life on earth, physical, mental, and spiritual. In Eve, the positive pole was suppressed and the negative pole expressed. In Adam, the negative pole was suppressed and the positive pole or positive expressed. So uh, I think the graphic helps to take away any stigma we may have about negative or positive as long as you're thinking electricity rather than Webster's. Most of you have heard of Yogananda, and he had a really nice way of putting it. The soul is neither male nor female, though karmic inclinations cause it to incarnate either with the body of a man or a woman. So it's making it clear that the soul itself doesn't have a gender. When we come into the earth, we may be working on things that require us to have the traits more of a female, or we may have, uh, have a better incarnation or soul growth if we come in that, the body of a man. So let me read the text which a soul would become, male or female, was a matter of choice unless the soul was already entangled and unbalanced. That, uh, that's going back, entangled and unbalanced is all of those strange mythical cre creatures we were talking about. And then they would have to get out of that body so that they could uh, reincarnate into a human body. Eventually, the positive and negative forces would have to be brought into balance, so there was not, basically, more advantage in one than in the other. So, in other words, it really doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It matters where you need the opportunities to be able to strengthen your ability to uh, balance the positive and negative forces of the soul. For souls in balance, <clears throat> it was a, uh, a device to be employed for the duration of the earth cycle and whichever sex would best suit the problems to be attacked was chosen. It was a voluntary assumption of an attitude, not a fall into error. And once a sex was assumed, it was generally retained through the cycle of earth lives, though it could be changed from life to life. If the change were considered advantageous, awareness of sex was retained between lives, but could only be expressed on earth. Okay, so the last one is making it clear that uh, sex as we uh, consummated here on Earth is not something that uh, takes place in the astral world or in the other dimensions where we don't have a three-dimensional uh, body as we do now. But it's uh, making, it, making it clear that, uh, 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 that we tend to come back as the same gender over and over again but it does not mean that from one life to another, if we need to work on the, if a, somebody is normally a female needs to come in and work as, uh, on work on things that are more male oriented, that you can do that. But generally you tend to come back as the female most often and have occasional male incarnations. And the opposite is true. If you're a male now, you're probably, uh, chances are, statistically speaking, not just for individuals, but you often come back as a male and then you wind up having an occasional female uh, incarnation. Man became aware with the advent of his consciousness that sex meant something more to him than to the animals. It was the door by which new souls entered the earth, a door unnecessary elsewhere in the system. So this is making it clear that on the earth, this is the only place that you have uh, sex, procreation through the birth canal and, and so on. And that... Uh, we, we became aware that uh, it does mean more to us than it does the animals, that you can express love 
preferably express love through the uh, through the sex act and so on. So I like the uh, goodness of sex. That it's uh, it is sex. There's nothing wrong with it. It is good, and God created us with the uh, capacity for love and communion to go along with. Uh, you know, the pleasures of sex, and it empowered us to create new life so that instead of souls having to come in and insert their their minds and in, in possibly create some monstrosity that we don't want, it allows them to incarnate into the perfect vehicle, the human body. And then God made us as sexual beings with equal dignity and worth, whether it's a male or a female. Okay, so you have the famous Da Vinci drawing there of uh, of a man with the seven spiritual centers or the chakras in the graphic. It was the only means the trap soul had of getting out of their predicament by being reborn through the bodies of souls which had entered the earth through choice. These bodies were not entangled with animals or thought forms. They represented the ideal vehicle for the soul on earth. Uh, there is not another species of, of animal out there that has the seven spiritual centers or endocrine uh, glands, ductless glands of the body, has all seven of them. There are some that exist in, in some other animals, but the uh, but it, uh, humanity is the only species that winds up having the seven that allows the soul to be able to perfectly manifest as Jesus uh, showed us. Therefore, sex was a creative power which could be used for good or evil. Used rightly, the race would be kept pure. The earth would be a paradise for souls and perfect bodies. The trapped souls could be free of their cycle of rebirth in monstrous half-animal forms and provided with perfect bodies. Now, when you're you're looking at this, it kind of sounds so a little bit like the Nazis and trying to, you know, purify the Aryan race. And... Uh, you know, that's not what it's headed for right there. What it's trying to say with used rightly, in other words, that we don't have negative connotations to go along with sex and that we're using it for love and we are using it to uh, commune with each other and to procreate that uh, there wasn't going to be a problem when it comes to uh, bringing up those monstrous half animal forms and the things that happen when we start having inbreeding today. The problem is, is after you start having bad thoughts and it starts to affect your DNA because the DNA, you know, they remember the salt crystal thing where our vibrations start to have an effect on the atomic structure of, uh, of that around us. And so we start to make our, bo our bodies be less and less perfect as they go. And then it's just a, a, vicious cycle downward to the point where we really can't uh, do inbreeding without having uh, problems come up along the way. So this is the story of Adam and Eve, the serpent and the apple. The serpent, wisdom, which Casey defines wisdom as the ability to be able to use knowledge for good. So the serpent was wisdom, offered the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Obviously, when you offer the uh, tree of knowledge, it turns into good and evil when the people who are eating from it have free will. If an angel eats from it, can only have good thoughts and, and make good choices, then it's the tree of good. <laughs> but when you have free will and you can go either direction with it, it is indeed the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve, the negative receptive force, took and fostered it. When a Adam, the active force, partook of it, the peaceful animal life of man was ended. So when you have the more uh, outgoing characteristics, and uh, obviously it's man that uh, human males that uh, tend to start all the wars out there, you can see our peaceful life was pretty much over once we understood that there were evil ways to be able to use our knowledge. Looks like a familiar graphic, but I added the uh, added the uh, text that makes it a lot more clear. The planets are three-dimensional representations of the eight dimensions in this solar system. The Earth is where we apply that uh, apply what we learn in those other dimensions between human incarnations. So let's see how. Tom Chagru uh, put it in here. The plan for the Earth cycle of souls was a series of incarnations coming into human bodies, inter, interlarded with, I think it's looted with, but maybe there's a typo or I never heard interlarded, with periods of dwelling and other dimensions of consciousness in the system 
the planets until every thought, every action of the physical body with its five senses and conscious mind was in accord with the plan originally laid out for the soul. Uh, it, this kind of reminds me of uh, the the horror stories over in um, Hawaii, if you've ever been over there, and they start telling you how all of a sudden they, you know, weren't supposed to, the things that came off of the ship like rats, you know, they're going, we didn't have rats. And all of a sudden your ships show up and we start getting rats all over the place. And then we're going to go get some other kind of uh, animal to go ahead and take care of the rats. And then we become overrun with that. And oh my gosh, there are chickens everywhere on some of those islands. It's uh, every time we take this very myopic, closed-minded approach to going, we're going to, we have this problem. We're going to use this thing to solve it. And, uh, you know, it just turns it worse and worse. What the whole idea of us being here is not only to spiritualize ourselves, but to be able to in, be in such tune with our intuition that our every action with our five senses and conscious mind once again goes in accord with the plan that was originally laid out, not only for the soul, but for the earth. By the way, the when you see these uh, Casey Clip um, uh, graphics here at the top, those are actually videos that I have already recorded. Uh, they're about five minutes long. And this particular one shows how to make reincarnation unnecessary. Uh, so in about five minutes, it's going to cover what Thomas Chagru could cover in a paragraph down below. But here we go. When the body was no longer a hindrance to the free expression of the soul, when the conscious mind had merged with the subconscious and the atomic structure of the body could be controlled so that the soul was as free in it as out of it, the earth cycle was finished and the soul could go on to new adventures. Exactly. We are addicted to being into human form. Once we attain this consciousness that it's talking about here, where everything is merged together and in perfect balance, that's when we realize, ooh, I don't have to come back here anymore. I'm free to go be a companion and co-creator throughout the universe with God. And if you want a longer explanation of that, go ahead and uh, look up the Casey clip, How to Make Reincarnation Unnecessary. The Gates of Arcturus. Uh, that's actually a book I, I wrote, it probably been a couple of years ago now. And uh, it is, it really does follow the various lies of Jesus, not all of them. Uh, Casey said there were 30. I probably have seven or eight in there, although I do uh, uh, focus in on each one of the five incarnations Jesus had as Adam. And it's uh, it's very much, uh, you know, it's two, 300 page book, but it takes each one of those lies and fictionalizes what Jesus was learning in each one of them and the trials and tribulations that Jesus had to go through as he was the various souls of Enoch and, and Melchizedek and uh, Joshua and Joseph at the cult, coat of many colors and so on. Anyway, the text here says, this conquest of the physical body could not be attained until there was perfection in the other dimensions of consciousness in the system. For these made up with the earth the total expression of the sun and its satellites, again, being the eight uh, dimensions that are out there. And, and, and I'm uh, obviously you can see the symbolism right there of the uh, various colored orbs, that color, according to the seven spiritual chakras, with the eighth dimension being the uh, Merkaba crystal is what it's called there in the middle, that Jewish, three dimensional Jewish star uh, representing the, uh, the earth from everything else we have. Whichever state of consciousness the soul assumed became the focal point of activity. The other states of consciousness receded to the position of urges and influences. So if uh, you remember from part one, I discussed if you had to deal with uh, anger issues or, or violence, that you would go to the dimension represented by Mars. And that is where you become absolutely focused on those kinds of lessons. It's not that the other urges within us don't exist, but those tend to be urges and influences that kind of, you know, uh, are filling in the gaps, if you will. But our total focus is supposed to be on whichever dimension we're in. In the case of, uh, of Venus, which was supposed to be like, you know, the, the dimension of love. So we're dealing with the aspects of love that are also like envy or is also teaching us the difference between eros and agape love or the kind of love that we physically have for each other or the kind of love that God has for us and hopefully vice versa. So then that would be our, our specific focus 
focus if we were in the dimension of Venus and so on. The race of man was fostered by a soul which had completed its experience of creation and returned to God, becoming a companion to him and a co-creator. This is the soul man knows as the Christ. Now, the you obviously you see the picture on the side there of, of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and that is the spelling that they gave in the Casey readings for Jesus's soul name, Amelius. So <clears throat> no matter whether I'm talking about Enoch or Melchizedek or Joshua or Asaph or uh, in, any one of the incarnations that uh, Edgar gave for uh, past lives of Jesus, the soul name was Amelius, in case you're interested. And uh, I've just thrown a few names up there according to the, um, uh, with the colors represent, being representative. So when you see red or Adam being the gonads, cells of Lydig for Enoch, the yellow for Hermes, Hermes is the uh, adrenals, Thymus is uh, Joseph in the coat of many colors, Joshua is the thyroid, Asaph is a uh, seer and a uh, musician and poet in the court of King David, and of course the highest one being Jesus. So the text says, the Christ soul was interested in the plight of its brother souls trapped in the earth. And after supervising the influx of the pure races, it took form itself from time to time to act as a leader for the people. So we're going to take a, a little closer look at uh, how Jesus wound up being born into the world, uh, <clears throat> even though that wasn't how he started. We are addicted to being human, the text says, though at first the souls but lightly inhabited bodies and remembered their identities, gradually, life after life, they descended into earthiness, into less mentality, less consciousness of the mind force. They remembered their true selves only in dreams, in stories, in fables handed down from one generation to another. Uh, the implication here is here, even though we have folklore and mythology and things like that, they are actually grounded in a bit of truth, even though they've definitely gone over the top. I mean, uh, the sun is not a uh, Apollo and his fiery chariot or uh, Artemis with, uh, you know, and her chariot and the moon and so on and so forth. But, uh, it, you know, when it, I gave you the definitions of what we would do with Mars or what we would do in the dimension of Venus, and they're not that far off. So it's letting us know that at first, when we say we lightly inhabited the bodies, I would think that our first appearances on the earth, we were very ethereal. We would have been like ghosts. And then we decided, desired to be in more and more till we became so physical as we are right now. And we are not in the earth, but not of it. We are in the earth and we are in the earth. Intuition is uh, a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. It's fascinating that you can have somebody which is one of the revered as one of the most logical minds of all time. And, and you ask Albert Einstein, what is one of the uh, greatest uh, talents we can have? He said creativity. He didn't say logic. He didn't say, you know, the ability to do physics or other types of math, et cetera. It was creativity was what made the real difference. And so if we understand that the rational mind is the faithful servant to our intuition, we have turned it the other way around. And we're going to focus on that for a few slides here. Religion came into being, a ritual of longing for lost memories. The arts were born, music, numbers, and geometry. These were brought to earth by the incoming souls. Gradually, their heavenly source was forgotten, and they had to be written down, learned, and taught to each new generation. So instead of having all knowledge from the Akashic records available to us through our intuition, we began, began to become so separated from it that we created things like politics and religion and science to be able to write everything down so that we could teach it from one generation to the next since we no longer had it naturally as part of our thinking. That's uh, what you give up when you limit your consciousness to the five senses and the conscious mind. That's a nice depiction of, uh, of really who we are. If you think of the Conscious and subconscious is being very much like that. It's kind of upside down now, but that funnel psychology and that if we ever take a look at a person, it's like seeing the tip of the iceberg that is appearing outside of the water. 
only 10% of it is outside of the water. 90% of who that person is, is not even visible to us. And so it makes a lot of sense to not try to uh, judge a book by its cover, so to speak. Remember, not the uh, lifetime of Edgar Casey, but the one before that is Bainbridge. Casey was kind of a ne'er-do-well, and he wasn't using his psychic abilities uh, for all the right purposes and all. So if you were to look at him in the Bainbridge incarnation and not recognize all the potential good that eventually in the next lifetime came out of him, it, uh, it, it gives you a better concept of what that uh, graphic showing you. So the text says, finally, man was left with a conscious mind definitely separated from his own individuality. He now calls this individuality the subconscious mind. His awareness of earth is the conscious mind. The subconscious mind influenced the conscious mind, gave it, in fact, its stature, breadth, and quality. It became the body under the suit of clothes. Only in sleep was it disrobed. So in other words, our conscious mind is limited. We, we accept what we get from our five senses as being the only thing that we can trust instead of being able to make a telepathic connection uh, with others or with the Akashic Records. When we sleep and we go into REM sleep and the soul is actually at that point able to leave the body, it's disrobed of the clothing of this physical body. And then we fully function as being uh, ethereal beings with telepathic powers and the ability to access the Akashic records. This is really showing uh, the graphic in the top. You have science and pseudoscience, but uh, you know, you're going to have cohort studies and case control and case series and reports and you know you have all kinds of research on the other side you have a i just know it i saw it on google i have intuition i uh you know i i saw a published article from 1956 i saw an anti-vax doctor on youtube uh, I, I, they really are making a, a lot of fun of people that are not based in science and yet have things that they very much believe and the text says, with his conscious mind, man reasoned, for all mind left to itself will work out the plans of God. So with his conscious mind, man reasoned. And that's where we wind up with the left side of science. It says, okay, we can do experiments and have the same thing happen over and over again. And uh, we can have peer-reviewed uh, 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 studies that we have conducted with making sure that we have all the proper controls and in, in place and have everybody else look at our numbers and our uh, conclusions and see if they agree with them. And that's where we are now that so many people wind up saying, if you can't uh, test and repeat that God exists for every single person that goes in there to do it, then God doesn't exist. He also built up theories for what he felt, but no longer knew to be true philosophy and theology resulted. So in other words, science, it, you know, pushed all of the metaphysical concepts that we had out that we couldn't prove. So philosophy and theology resulted. So we created those things uh, man-made as opposed to being uh, uh, God's creation. Man began to look around him and discover in the earth secrets which he carried within himself but could no longer reach with his consciousness. The result was science. So we figured if we can do, uh, what do they call that? When they, um, when they go backwards, they, they uh, uh, counter engineer, reverse engineering, that's it. So that you go ahead and let's say that you want to take a, a computer and you want to be able to duplicate it. You just take it apart and you put all of the, uh, you know, the components down, you know exactly what it takes to put it back together again. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but to reverse engineer something, it's actually legal to do this. You can buy it. You can get all of this stuff into a huge manual out here in which you identify every part and how they go together. And the person who wrote that, he gets fired. He says, you go away and you have a completely different person come over and look at all of the stuff work he did in order to be able to get it reverse engineered down into paperwork. And then he creates it from that. That's actually legal in most cases. So it's a uh, it's an interesting thing we have done to ourselves. Uh, another one of my uh, own quotes up there. Humans are like video game avatars to our souls. So, you know, when you think uh, video game avatars 
are the are the little cartoon characters or whatever they are that are in the digital domains uh, you probably heard of world of warcraft or fortnite and that with the humans that are sitting on at home with their game controller are controlling the avatars well if we humans are like uh a soul is to our physical body here on earth that the avatars don't have the ability to be able to say i'm going to prove that i have a human controlling me or that there are programmers that actually put our universe together and and the same thing is true when we have humans that are saying we have such limited science when everything we're talking about is beyond these three dimensions that created us in the first place can digital avatars prove their human users or creators exist? No, because they lack the tools and technology needed to do so in their digital world. Can humans prove souls exist? Yes, but only when we move from science to intuition, meditation. So the text says, the plan of man went into action, downward. He went from heavenly knowledge to mystical dreams, revealed religions, philosophy, and theology until the bottom was reached, and he only believed what he could see and feel and prove in terms of his conscious mind. Then he began to fight his way upward, using the only tools he had left, suffering, patience, faith, and the power of the mind. So we still have our mind. And if we're suffering, they go, there has to be a better way of being able to live. And if we are patient and persevere and say, I'm still suffering, I need to do something better in order to not be su suffering anymore. And to have the faith that says, God's going to help me see the right way to be able to do this so I no longer have to suffer. You can see once we hit bottom, we had to go back using those few tools that we had left. Uh this is an interesting one because a lot of people feel like, oh, the uh, traditional Christians say we're going to have the rapture any day now. Uh, but the KC readings make it clear we're going to be here a while. The preparation for the needs of man has gone down many, many thousands and millions of years, as is known in this plane, for the needs of man in the hundreds of thousands of years to come. So in one sentence there, it says, we've been at this earth for millions of years and for the needs of man in the hundreds of thousands of years to come. So we're fulfilling our needs. That says man's going to still be here for hundreds and even thousands of years. So that means at least 2000 more years before somebody gets to turn the lights out on this planet and away we go. And, you know, 1000 of them has to be when the millennium starts. So here's the text. Atlantis and Lemuria sank, civilizations rose and fell. Man was here a little better, there a little worse. He descended to the depths of Earth's conscious, uh, Earth consciousness, then slowly began to climb back. In earthly seasons, it was a long journey from the moment when the first soul, looking down through the trees, saw a violet, as in a flower, saw a violet and wanted to pluck it, to the instant when the last soul should leave its body forever. So it's going to take a while for us to be able to completely vacate the earth as humans. So you see <clears throat> artist renderings of what Enoch and uh, Melchizedek, who were both uh, supposed to be past incarnations of Emilius, or the soul we knew as Jesus. So the Christ soul helped man as Enoch, as Melchizedek. It took on flesh to teach and lead. Since it was to be active, it had to be male. Enoch and Melchizedek were not born, did not die. The Christ soul realized after these assumptions of flesh that it was necessary to set a pattern for man to show him the way back to himself. So in other words, in the early attempts, if you go back on the, you know, these are, well, the book of Enoch didn't quite make it to the Bible, even though we still have it. And uh, the book of Melchizedek is... Um, uh, or his, the mentions of him are uh, are much earlier in the Old Testament after the Pentateuch, and you wind up uh, seeing that Jesus as the soul Amelius incarnated not through the birth canal, but inserting himself into fully grown individuals, Enoch and Melchizedek, and said, hey, this is the way out of here. And of course, all of us humans just say, where did you come from? And we aren't anything like you because, you know, look at the way you come and go and look at the way we get into this world. And these guys don't even die. They just translate and they disappear one day when they decide they're they're not 
wanting to be on the earth anymore. So it uh, it was only in this pattern that goes, coming in here and just inserting my consciousness and creating a body, even if it looks like theirs, is not, uh, is not the way to be able to show it to them. I have to come in through the birth canal, be raised as them, live among them, preach as I did, go through some really horrible things, say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and show even after they've killed the body that I'm able to resurrect it as I need it. So here are a number of uh, of uh, depictions of the lifetimes that are mentioned in the text down below. It assumes this task and was born. It assumed this task and was born of woman, beginning voluntarily a new individuality, a new soul record. Though behind this new individuality shone the pure Christ soul, but on this the veil dropped, and the Son of God began his pilgrimage. He was born as Joseph, again as Joshua, again as Jeshua, the scribe of Enoch, who rewrote the Bible, and finally as Jesus. So you had a uh, a lot of the um, scribing that was done. It was in an incarnation as Jeshua, which was post Enoch. I don't think they uh, were around at the same time. And you're seeing that uh, each one of those is uh, you you go from being Enoch or Melchizedek that just uh, appear and disappear. And he said, I need to come in through the birth canal and, and have the uh, the body go through the entire life cycle to be the perfect role model for everybody else who is out there. Follow Jesus, our perfect role model. He, Jesus, triumphant over death and the body, became the way, laying down the ego of the will, accepting the crucifixion, returning to God. He is the pattern we are to follow.